Uh, good morning. My name is Nathan Hughes, and I'm the young adult pastor here at The Grove. And uh, if you guys have been journeying with us, we've been going through a series titled Wisdom from Proverbs. And I'm so excited. Uh, Matt challenged us to read one proverb a day. And I hope you guys have been doing this because it's been life-changing. And what wisdom in Proverbs does is it gives us the ability to have some introspection and to stop and to look at ourselves and to say, hey, what's really going on here? And um, so this message that I've prepped is from Proverbs chapter 16. So if you guys are on track with us, you should have read that yesterday. So you're all caught up and you're going to be ready to go. Um, it's Proverbs chapter 16, verse 16 says, how much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. And I was thinking about this, and I'm like, man, so often it's so much easier to p pursue worldly possessions rather than wisdom. And even in light of Palmer's message last week, he spoke on finances. And I wanted to remind all of us that Jesus did talk the most about finances, more than any other subject. More than heaven and hell combined, he talked about our money. And I asked myself, why? And it's because wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I was reminded that death takes us to one of two places. It takes us to our treasure, or it takes us from our treasure. So where's our heart at? And what happens is we get so consumed with having stuff that we put wisdom on the back burner. So even when we do want wisdom, we treat it like the rest of our life. And we think that we can just reach out and grab wisdom like we can a Big Mac at McDonald's or our Starbucks coffee. So we're so used to having and having now. And the thing with wisdom is you can't just reach out and grab it. You have to become a wise person. That's how it works. So instead of pursuing valuable things, you need to become a person of value. And that happens through being made wise. Um, this verse that really just tied my whole message together, it comes from Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. And I've heard this verse over and over and over again in the King James Version. I want to share it with you guys in the message version. It says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when we attend to what he reveals, we are most blessed. The King James Version says, where vision is lacking, the people perish. And I've gone to leadership seminars, and over and over again, they use this verse. They quote this verse. And they say, hey, if you want to be successful, you got to know where you're going. you got to set goals. And I was thinking to myself as I'm prepping this, I'm like, it's so much more than that. It really is. Without, if we can't see God and his word, we're going to stumble all over ourselves for our entire lives. And so I was thinking, I'm like, what is it? that we're always constantly stumbling over. So wisdom gives us the ability to see our true self. Wisdom gives us this ability to see our true self. And I ask myself, what is it that, keep, that uh, makes us people that would rather pursue gold or silver rather than wisdom and insight? And Proverbs chapter 16, verse two states, all a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25 states, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. And I can't tell you how many times in my life I've uh, thought that I know what's best for my life. I know right from wrong. Like, I don't need your opinion. And my personal favorite is, last I checked, it's my life to live. So who are you to try to tell me how to live my life? And so I'm wrestling with this content, and I'm like, man, where does this come from? And parents, you have seen this. So when you um, have your babies, they're the cutest little creatures ever. Like, they're so sweet. I have nieces and nephews, and you could just sit and stare at them. And it's like, wow, like, you just came out of another human being. Like, and we think aliens don't exist? Like, this is crazy. It's, it's bizarre. So what happens is, parents, have we ever sat our children down when they reach, like, one to two years old, and we're like, okay. You know how to say daddy and mommy and some other words. Now I'm going to teach you the most important word. You're going to be able to get whatever you want after you learn this word. So we stoop down and we say, okay, repeat after me. Mine. Good. Say it again. Louder this time. Mine. Now repeat it over and over again until you get what you want. Like, no, no parent ever had to do that with their kid. It just happens. And then also, too, blaming. Like, when your kid grows up and he starts to do some bad stuff, like, throw rocks at cars or light a field of palm trees on fire with some fireworks. When you catch your kid doing this bad stuff, 
they always seem to confess and just ask for forgiveness, right? Like, no, this never happens. What we do is we, we have great friends growing up, so we blame our friends. Like, mom, it wasn't me, it was John, you know? Like, I didn't light the fire, he did. So what we do is we blame. From an early age, we learn this. And what blaming is, is I'm not comfortable with the pain and the discomfort of fessing up or being wrong or doing wrong, so I'd rather push that off onto somebody else. And what happens is we grow up and we don't really grow out of this. We just get really good at disguising it. So you're not gonna have some 40-year-old guy running around saying, hey, that's mine, that's mine, bawling his eyes out. But I do cut people off on the freeway and I treat it like it's my highway and I'm the only person who has to get to work on time in the morning, you know? And then honestly, just last week, I'm prepping this message and I'm at Agritopia, I'm at the coffee shop. And I'm sitting down at a table, kind of like that one back there. And this table has eight seats around it. So I sit on the end cap and I'm sitting right here. There's empty seats all around me. And I set my books off to my side. I'm like, yeah, this seat's for my books, you know? Get everything out, open my Bible up. Such a great Christian, watch this. So then a couple walks in and they sit right next to me on that open seat and then on the other one. So the girl's sitting here, the guy's sitting there and I was just like, dang, like, you could sit at the other end of the table. You can't see my books are right here, like seriously? And I checked myself, I'm like, man, come on, relax. So then another gentleman walks in, he sits on my left. And I'm like, sweet, we're having a party at my end of the table. So this is great. And then another, a dad with two kids comes in and he tries to sit down and the gentleman who just walked in, he says, oh, sir, I'm sorry, I'm saving this table. I'm actually reserving these seats. So now me and the other couple are kind of like, huh. So then another Another group walks in and they try to sit down and he says the same thing. And this time he says, I'm actually reserving all these seats. It's my son's birthday and, and I need seven seats. And so this couple, they're like, okay, I get it. And they take off. And I'm sitting there and I count all the open seats and I'm the seventh seat. And I was like, no way, dude, I'm not leaving. I was like, I was here first. I'm studying. I'm actually prepping a message on pride and humility. What a joke. <laughs> So then what I did after that is I closed up my studies and I was like, all right, I'm out of here. And I'm asking myself, because we still see this even after we come to Christ, and it can be so destructive in our lives. And I'm like, where does this come from? And then I read Proverbs chapter 16 again. God is speaking to us. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. That's Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. So I'm thinking about this and I'm, I'm reading it. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule or have dominion over the fish, the birds, the livestock, all the wild animals. God gave us dominion, authority over everything. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 to 17. And then the Lord God commanded, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will surely die. And I'm reading this and I'm like, man, like God is so good. He gives us dominion over everything. We have authority. But he says, here's this one tree. Don't eat from this tree. And I used to struggle with that growing up. And I've studied a lot and I've listened to some theologians that are a lot smarter than me and a lot of philosophers. And what this tree represents is it represents true love. It represents obedience. The, the power of decision lies in her choices. So every day that Adam and Eve walked by this tree, they remembered that a good, loving God created all of this, and it was for them, but they still had to choose to love this God at the end of the day. So then, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, now the serpent was more crafty than anyone else, and he said to the woman, did God really say, don't eat from that tree? Did he really say that? And it's funny because we had everything that we could possibly need or want. But pride is not concerned in having, only in having more than. And we see how deceitful pride is. Pride is what got Satan cast from heaven to hell. Pride is what crept into the human heart and caused us to view God and ourself differently. Pride's what crept into Eden and turned a beautiful garden into a broken world. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 26 says, those who trust themselves are fools, 
but those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. What does it mean to trust yourself? It means that you don't look to an outside source for any advice, wisdom, guidance, accountability. And if we're going to see what we've been stumbling over, if wisdom is going to give us this ability, the first thing that we have to recognize about pride is more than anything else, pride wants to be God. It doesn't want to be like God. It wants to be God. So pride is self-seeking. It doesn't want to be under authority. And we see that in the garden, and we still see that in our lives today. And so what happens is we try to make ourselves the ultimate authority. So we go out and pursue power, success, fame, and fortune. And we think that these things are going to bring us meaning and purpose in our life. And what happens when we pursue power, success, fame, and fortune is we're attacked for the rest of our lives by fear and anxiety. Because we spend our entire lives trying to prove ourselves trying to defend ourselves. Even people that don't believe in God are still out there trying to earn their salvation. It's so bizarre. When you, a being created to live for God, live instead for yourself, you violate your design. That's what Tim Keller said. It's a beautiful quote. And this can show up in so many different places in our life. Um, We can build our identity on our career. Our value can be on our bank account, or we can place all of who we are on our significant other or our spouse. And what happens is all it takes is a little seed of pride to destroy a marriage or to destroy a human life. And I think about my mom, for example. From an early age, my mom chose drugs. And I love my mom so much, and she's so joyful. She's so sweet. I can still see her smile and hear her laugh in my head. But Satan is so crafty. So what can start as this small decision that we think isn't going to have a lasting, damaging impact can over time. So what happens is pride creeps into our life, and it ends up bringing so much destruction. No matter how many pleasures Satan offers us, his ultimate purpose is to ruin us. Our destruction is his highest priority. That's why it's so important for us to recognize the pride in our lives, to be able to see it. And then pride constantly compares itself to others. If pride wants to be superior more than anything else, you can't be or feel superior if you don't have someone to compare yourself to. So um, a, a lot of psychologists have coined this term as the superiority complex. And it comes from this constant need to prove or defend ourselves. And I'm, for example, if somebody told me that I was wrong growing up, I would argue with you and prove to you that I was right, even though I was wrong. And we'd walk away from that conversation and you'd be like, dang, I don't know how he's right, but okay, makes sense. And when you are told that you're wrong, if your first initial response is to defend yourself, you're probably dealing with pride. And what happens is pride needs to compare itself and we have a superiority complex and we see this lived out in daily life. And I don't know if you guys go to the gym, but when I go to the gym, there's these guys in there and they walk in the gym and walk around the gym like they're getting ready to go to battle. Like these guys walk in the gym and they just have these mean, nasty looks on their faces. And I'm like looking around and I just started smiling, you know? So you see these guys and I'm just smiling and they're walking around. And what these guys do is they wanna prove themselves. So they'll go find somebody that they know they're stronger than and they'll go work out next to them. And if there's somebody that is stronger than them or bigger than them and they know it, they'll go to the other side of the gym. Like, they don't, want to, they don't want to compare themselves. And ladies do this too. I hear this, like, oh my gosh, did you see what she was wearing? And at church, like, this isn't a nightclub. Like, wait for Friday night, sweetie. It's like, so what we do is we look to other people to compare ourselves with. And it's because we want to maximize their faults and minimize our own. That's what pride does. It needs to compare itself in order to feel superior. So what we do also is we find people that are worse than us. And it's not because we want to hang out with them. It's because we want to talk about them. Like, that's what gossip is. It's a a defense mechanism. It's what we do in order to feel better about ourselves. And we're all guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. Pride constantly wants to compare itself to others. There's a passage in Scripture that depicts this perfectly. It's in Luke chapter 18, verses 10 to 14. It says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Everybody respected the Pharisees because they had it all going on. They were the religious elite. 
They were perfect. Everybody hated the tax collectors. They were like the IRS. Like, you don't even know anybody from the IRS, but if you met someone and they said, hey, I work for the IRS, you would hate them instantly. It's just the way it is. So the tax collector, he takes money from his own people, but he adds more on top to fill his own pockets. So we see at the beginning what Jesus is doing. So the tax collector and the Pharisee go up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, like robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this here tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I've got. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me. I tell you that this man rather than the, than the other, Jesus said, went home justified. The man that everybody hated went home justified. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Pride doesn't look, pride looks to compare itself to others, just like that Pharisee did. And then the next thing, pride is always aware of itself. What pride does is it makes us radically self-conscious. It makes us insecure. So um, if you get to the end of your day, hear me out real quick. None of us, nobody ever gets to the end of their day and they're getting ready for bed and you're like, man, my ankles worked great today. Like there's no popping, there's no clicking. I didn't even have any shooting pain. Like I'm proud of you guys, good job. Nobody does that. If there's not a problem with your ankles, your ankles don't call attention to themselves. If your ankles are broken or sprained, it's like, dude, tell me your story, man. Like, how did that happen? Can I sign your cast? Or if your ankle's sprained, like, oh my gosh, you have a cankle. Like, that thing's so swollen. Like, how'd you do that? Look at that bruising. Tell me about your ankles. I want to hear your story. How did you, how'd that happen? If, you're, if there's nothing wrong with your ankles, they don't call attention to themselves. Why, when we get to the end of our day, we can't help but think, I'm not enough, or nobody likes me, or I can't believe that person talked to me the way they did. And we see our self is constantly calling attention to itself. We have an injured ego. We see that there's something wrong. And it's funny because when we think of pride, we think of somebody who is really proud or really arrogant. But pride can also show itself in what's called a self-pity complex. It's where we're always playing the victim in every single situation. Pride has this way of making us too high during the high times and way too low during the low times. Now um, what I have is what I like to call the antidote. Humility. Humility. Humility doesn't want to be God. It wants to be like God. Pride doesn't want to be under authority. Humility loves to be under authority. It loves it. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 2 says, with humility comes wisdom. And King Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3, he had this encounter with God in a dream. And God said, ask me for whatever you want. And this is what Solomon said. 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 7 and 9. But I'm only a little child and I don't know how to carry out my duties. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people, to distinguish between right and wrong. Solomon could not become wise without humility. It's impossible. And humility recognizes its true self, and it knows that it needs help. It doesn't want to do this life alone. And humility is honestly what saved my life. So all throughout my life, me and my brother had other people that constantly took care of us from an early age. It was our parents, it was our aunts and uncles, it was complete strangers, it was our best friend's family. And I remember when um, our mom had her stroke, um, our best friend's family took us in when we were 16 to 17 years old. And they treated us just as if we were their own children. And so what happened was we went off to college and we would come back and we'd spend weekends with them, we'd spend holidays with them. And they were our family. And as I was away at college, I started to notice they adopted uh, two siblings, and they had friends, and then they also had like distant cousins, and they were always taking people in, and they were always letting people live there and stay there until they got their feet up on the ground. And I remember being so frustrated on their behalf, 
And I thought, to, I thought to myself and I said, I said, why don't you guys just enjoy your home? Like, stop letting people move in with you. You guys are limited to like one bedroom and your whole, the whole rest of your house is taken up. Even like people are sleeping on the couch. Like, this is crazy. And then I had this realization. I'm like, man, imagine if somebody would have said that to them before me and my brother got there. Like, we would have been lost. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less so that you can think of others more. Humility constantly looks within. Humility doesn't look at other people to compare and to maximize faults and minimize our own. Humility looks within. And what happens is pride and vulnerability, they can't coexist. It's like cats and dogs. So if you're a proud person, there's no way you can be vulnerable. It's a false sense of vulnerability if you are. And what happens is prideful people don't want to look inferior or weak. So they pretend to be strong. And they don't want to deal with their feelings and emotions. And I'm telling you this because this is what I've seen in my life with my own experiences. Is that for the most part, women have a deeper, more intimate relationship with God because they're not scared of their emotions. They're not scared of being real about the things that they struggle with. And men, this is where we miss the mark and this is where we need to grow, is we think what it means to be strong is to look strong from the outside. And true strength comes from looking within and recognizing how desperate our heart is. And I heard this story from a Christian apologist. His name is Ravi Zacharias. And Ravi Zacharias is an Indian man. He was born and raised in India, found Jesus when he was 17, and he spent his entire life defending the faith. So uh, he does debates, and he's like upwards in his 70s now. He's honestly one of the best speakers, one of the most knowledgeable guys I've ever heard or listened to or read his stuff. So Ravi Zacharias said that one of his mentors, his name is Malcolm Mugridge, He's a British journalist who's responsible for making Mother Teresa famous on the West. And Malcolm Mugridge was an agnostic growing up. So Malcolm didn't believe in anything. And he told Ravi this story, and it forever changed Ravi's life. Malcolm, before he came to Christ, he was spending time in India, and he was a journalist. And he went down to the river in India, and he was swimming, and it was dusk. So the sun was getting ready to go down. And he said he saw the silhouette of a woman across the river. And he had this deep desire that said, I want her. And so what he did was he started swimming across the river to go and to get this woman. And he said, as he's swimming, he feels his heart racing and he hears this voice and it says, no, don't, stop, turn back. And he says, with everything that was inside of him, he suppressed his voice and he swam harder. And he got to the other side of the river and he came up out of the water And this Indian woman was shocked to see this white man coming out of the water to invade her privacy. And she's standing there, covering herself up, looking at him. And he said he was shocked to see that her fingers were gone. Her nose was gone. Her lips were gone. Her eyes were sunken to the back of her head. And he was looking upon an Indian woman with leprosy. And he said, my first initial thought was, what a hideous, ugly monster. And he said, no, 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 I've got it all wrong. What a hideous, ugly heart that's inside of me. And what happens is we think that evil is so pervasive and destructive out there in this world, but it can also be so deep and destructive in here. And we see so many problems in today's world comes from this pride that has infected our heart. And what happens is you don't have love without evil. That's what's so cruel about this world is the same exact ingredients it takes to make love, it takes to make evil. Freedom, passion, anger. If you're never angry, you don't love anything. The Bible says be angry but do not sin. And then desire. Freedom, passion, anger, desire. And I'm convinced, put a little bit of pride in those ingredients and you have evil. Put a little bit of humility in those ingredients and you have love. So we need to look at our own hearts. Humility looks within and it recognizes how desperate we are. And that's also the day that we become an answer for other people rather than just another question. Um, 
There's a story, humility, my last point about humility is, humility looks a lot like Jesus. Solomon was the wisest man in the world. He had wisdom, but he wasn't wisdom. He didn't embody wisdom. Um, Solomon still ended up having to prove himself at the end of his life. And it's so funny that Paul's talking about the chief with two wives. Solomon ended up having 700 wives and 300 concubines. Like, man, isn't one hard enough? I mean, Solomon was really wise, but he was really stupid too, as you can see. And scripture says that his wives led him astray. And God's judgment didn't fall upon Solomon, it fell upon his son. How tragic is that? And we see that Solomon could not save his people. He couldn't save us. We see that we needed so much more. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50. One of the most powerful um, stories in Scripture. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Jesus answered him and said, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. And then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and she wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But, for, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. And then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. When pride, when a Pharisee looks at a sinner, sees a prostitute. When humility, when Jesus looks at a prostitute, sees potential. Jesus doesn't see what or who she is. He sees who she can become. And I feel like so many of us have such a hard time, not only forgiving other people, but forgiving ourselves. And even when I think back on my mom's life, it's kind of funny. My mom, like, she had to have a paternity test with three different guys to find out who was mine and my brother's father. So, like, when I read this story, I think about, like, what did my mom go through when she had children out of wedlock? Were people judging her? Were they there for her? Did they love on her? Did they show her that she has a hope and a future in Christ and what she can become? And um, when my mom had her stroke and my brother went to Africa, I was visiting my mom on my own and I would go and I would see her and I got so discouraged because I felt like I wasn't doing anything. And I got to where I was reading her the gospels and talking to her about Jesus and my mom struggled so much. She would ask me why God was punishing her. And uh, she would ask me, she'd say, why does God hate me? And I'd tell her, mom, God doesn't hate you. And it reminds me that pride can bring so much destruction in our lives. But humility has come to save and to redeem and to restore. So what happens is I would go and I would visit my mom and I would read to her and I would get there and I would see her. She's either in her bed or in her wheelchair and I would just stare at her and she's just sitting there. And I'm like, man, this is her life. This is all she's got. And one time, I don't know why, I decided to, every time I would see her and I would come into her room, she would light up when she saw me. 
and I filmed it, and I will have this video of my mom I want to show you guys. I'm convinced that my mom sees more than her son. She sees the face of Christ. She sees the face of Jesus. And what happens is when we choose pride over humility, we show people ourselves. We don't show them Christ. And if we're going to change this world, the world needs to see the face of Christ. If we're going to change our community like this church is doing, this community needs to see the face of Jesus. If you're going to restore your marriages, your families, they need to see the face of Christ. There's this quote that I'm going to leave you guys with. And this quote means everything to me because I've seen it in my mom's life. Wisdom is knowing that without Christ, we have nothing. But with Christ, despite our circumstances, we have everything. Thank you, guys. Thank you.